nothing beats a great horror film. But fans have come up with plenty of theories that make some of your favorite horror movies even more horrific. These theories might just change everything. Are you ready? Let's go! If you're looking for films with deep, hidden meanings, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre probably isn't on any list, no matter how long it is. But some believe it's actually an incredibly gory commentary on animal rights, the horrors of animal slaughter in the meat industry, and ultimately, why you should probably give vegetarianism a chance. In case you've forgotten some of the details, the Sawyer family, which includes the infamous Leatherface, are actually from a long line of slaughterhouse operators. There's animal bones all over, after all, and you hear the sounds of animals almost constantly. One of the characters even describes just how animals are slaughtered. And when the Sawyer family finally sits down to a meal of people, they make animal noises at their final victim. Peter wrote about the movie being one of the biggest films ever made in support of vegetarianism. And even though you might not want to believe PETA, director Toby Hooper even said that he stopped eating meat when they were filming. In a way, I thought the heart of the film was about meat. It's about the chain of life and killing sentient beings, and it has cannibalism in it. Although you have to come to that conclusion by yourself, because it's only implied. He goes on to say that Guillermo del Toro went vegetarian after seeing the film. And if you can freak out the director of Pan's Labyrinth enough that he makes a major lifestyle change, we're guessing your mission was accomplished. When we first saw the trailers for Cabin in the Woods, we admit it, we cringed. It was like every single trope was stuffed into one movie. And seriously, Joss Whedon, we expected so much more. Did you lose a bet? Fortunately, Joss Whedon didn't sell out, and we find out later that the whole thing is set up by a group of creepers called Facility. A hair dye. Dumb blonde. Very artistic. Works its way into the blood through the scalp very gradually. According to one fan theory, Kurt's in on it the whole time and working for the Creepers. Kurt is the one that leads the proverbial lambs to the slaughter. Take a rewatch and you'll see that he might have done a few questionable things, like getting his girlfriend alone so she can die, and maybe not doing all that he probably could have to get them out alive. Sure, he dies, but it's definitely not the first time someone's been double-crossed. There's another theory that brings the audience into this, and it's not a flattering one. If Facility is responsible for keeping the old gods appeased with their sacrifice of teenage blood, so they stage a show for the gods before giving them their sacrifices, isn't that a metaphor for exactly what the filmmakers are doing by giving you the movie to watch? The Facility are the movie makers and the writers, and they're appeasing you by giving you the blood and guts you want. You heathens. Your basic human needs disgust me. Get out of here. The Scream series is a classic. We know, there's enough of them. But the original set of movies were probably enough to make any teenager look at their peers with a bit of suspicion. And to be fair, it was probably all rightfully deserved. We eventually find out that there's been two killers on the loose the whole time, Billy and Stu. What's the matter, Sydney? You look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> Part of the game, Sydney. Pretty straightforward, but one theory says that there were three killers. Roman Bridger explains at the end of Scream 3 that he's Sydney's illegitimate brother, and he first showed up in town before all this killing stuff started happening. When he did show up, he was shunned by his mother, and if you've ever seen an episode of Criminal Minds, you know that's just the sort of thing that'll kick off a killing spree. And according to him, that's just what happened. He's the one that plotted to destroy everything and sent the two long-accepted killers off on their spree, while he joined in every so often. If you take a rewatch and look for continuity errors, you'll find a couple of major ones that could be explained away by a third killer. In the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, the premise is that Freddy Krueger is a vengeful ghost, using the dream realm to murder the children of the people who had him killed. This is a pretty straightforward motivation, but in the course of its infinite sequels, Freddy definitely ends up killing some kids that had nothing to do with his death. Also, in Freddy's Dead, we learn that the powers that Freddy gained from the demons are to enter dreams, be eternal, and crack wicked one-liners. Those powers don't include stretching his arms like Inspector Gadget, or turning into a TV, or becoming a giant snake monster. Where does he get these powers? There is a theory that tries to answer both of these questions. Since we know Dream Warriors exist, and that Freddy takes the souls of the children he kills, what if Freddy absorbs the powers of the children he kills? This would explain why Freddy becomes more and more powerful over the course of the series, if you don't like sequel-fueled power creep as an explanation. It also explains why he would go after kids unrelated to his death, as well as why he would do so in such outlandish ways. The idea that Freddy might be after anyone and that his power will only increase over time definitely turns him into more of a threat. 
John Carpenter's The Thing is one of the scariest movies of all time. A shape-shifting alien monster means death could look like anyone or anything, even someone you previously thought you could trust. What could be scarier than that? Well, what if there were two shape-shifting alien monsters? The premise of this fan theory is that there are in fact two different creatures, one that is introduced in the form of the dog and one that is in the corpse taken from the Norwegian site. But an interesting twist to the theory is that they're not working in tandem but rather against each other. This theory presumes that the alien spreads infection through saliva, and that's why there are so many conspicuous scenes of people sharing bottles. This means that McReady is Thing 1 and did the blood test to flush out Thing 2. It's a crock of shit. The final scene shows a laughing, victorious Thing 1 in the form of McReady, handing his bottle to an about-to-be-infected child. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is one of the most significant influences on John Carpenter's Halloween, and Carpenter wasn't afraid to wear this influence on his sleeve. He even borrowed character names from Psycho and applied them to his own characters, most notably in the form of Dr. Sam Loomis, Michael Myers' psychiatrist who shares a name with Marion Crane's boyfriend in Psycho. But what this theory suggests is, what if he didn't borrow that name? What if the two Sams are one and the same? The original Loomis is, of course, the one who catches Norman at the end of Psycho. What if all that business with a psychopath inspired Loomis to try and stop anyone else from experiencing the pain he felt? He goes back to school, gets a degree in psychiatry, moves to Illinois, and one of his first patients is a little boy in a clown costume who just murdered his own sister. This makes Loomis's story all the more tragic and makes his occasionally extreme reactions to Michael more understandable because they're more personal. Neil Marshall's 2005 film The Descent is one of the best-regarded horror films of the 2000s due in no small part to effectively using its cave system setting to evoke a real claustrophobic reaction in its audiences from the dark, cramped tunnels. In fact, for some viewers, this horror movie would be scarier if it were just about getting lost in some caves and there weren't any freaky, mutated cave monsters in the movie at all. Well, uh, what if there weren't? This particular theory proposes that the crawlers who dominate the latter portions of the film don't actually exist and that the dead spelunkers are all killed by a hallucinating Sarah. Hallucination is, after all, a recurring fear in the movie. Furthermore, we see Sarah kill five crawlers, which lines up exactly with the five cavers who were killed. The whole trip is meant to help Sarah overcome her past traumas, but what if instead it triggered something much worse? Could it be that the descent of the title is also Sarah's descent into a trauma-induced tragic madness? The Paranormal Activity franchise was hugely successful, with the first film having been made for a mere $15,000 and earning $193 million at the box office. It naturally spawned a host of sequels, five domestically and one in Japan. How did Oren Pelly, a first-time director whose previous work experience was primarily in software programming, manage to make one of the most profitable horror franchises in history? The demon that haunts multiple families across the span of the Paranormal Activity franchise shows both that it knows when it's being filmed and also that its powers increase when people are aware and afraid of it. This theory then presumes that the demon is real and also that the footage of the Paranormal Activity films is authentic. Spooky. Oren Pelly made a deal with the demon in exchange for wealth and success, with the understanding that Pelly would bring the footage in front of international audiences, scaring innumerable millions and thereby greatly increasing the demon's power. Although we can't possibly know what the demon wants to do with its newfound power, it can't be worse than what Pelly did with his, which was to make Chernobyl diaries. That's an atrocity worse than claiming a few firstborn sons. The Exorcist is widely regarded as one of the best and indeed scariest horror movies ever made. It was the first horror movie ever nominated for a Best Picture Oscar and has become the standard by which all scary movies have been measured ever since. So how do you make history's scariest movie even scarier? One theory suggests that the demon, identified as Pazuzu in both the Exorcist novel and the sequel Exorcist II Heretic, but only given the name Captain Howdy in the first film, has an even greater influence than is popularly believed. At one point in the film, Father Karras is confronted by a homeless man who asks him for money, surprising him. Later on, Pazuzu repeats the homeless man's words to Karras via the possessed Reagan. While the obvious interpretation is that Pazuzu is using the man's words simply to torment Karis, the theory poses the idea that the homeless man was in fact a demonic agent of Pazuzu, and Reagan's repetition of his words is meant to communicate to Karis that he is always being watched. 
This also neatly ties up the question of how Pazuzu knows about Karis' mother. She doesn't have to have ended up in hell for Pazuzu to have information on her if he has spies on Earth reporting to him. A well-informed demon is a more efficient demon. Among horror fans, the Evil Dead franchise is one of the most beloved film series in the history of the genre, but it's also one of the strangest franchises in the genre's history, as the tone of each successive film, not counting the 2013 remake slash sequel, is more comedic than the previous one. The first Evil Dead is played pretty straight and almost entirely for scares, with trees doing things trees oughtn't do. But by Army of Darkness, Ash is dropping quotable one-liners and doing full-on Three Stooges routines. <laughs> While the real-life explanation for this tonal shift is that Sam Raimi and the other creators of the series felt that comedy came to them more easily than straightforward horror, what if there were an in-universe reason for things becoming more cartoonish as time goes on? One theory has an idea on this. Ash is progressively losing his mind more and more over time. You can practically see Ash's mind snap in the first half of Evil Dead 2. And from that moment on, things start to get sillier. <laughs> Not only do the scenarios get more bizarre, but Ash also begins to become so detached from reality that he stops fearing the Deadites as much as he should, and so they start getting depicted as increasingly bumbling and clownish. This theory certainly gives Army of Darkness a darker sheen. Crazy or not, though, there's no denying that Ash is still king. Hail to the king, baby. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.